Department of Civil Architecture and Environmental Engineering are the hosts today for Dr. Pavada. So please join me in them taking the time in order to make sure that Dr. Pavada knew about us. And also, please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Um, thank you, Dean, for the warm welcome. Uh, can you hear me at the back? Okay. If at any time you can't hear me, stop me so that I can go nearer the mic. Um, so I'm going to be talking about innovation in the consumer product industry. Um, for this industry, this is a lifeblood. Um, consumers are sort of constantly expecting new and improved, and I'm sure as you are buying the various products and you're going to the supermarket aisle, you are looking for the new and improved. A consequence of that is, in the U.S. alone, there are over 2,000 new products being introduced every year. Globally, that number exceeds 60,000. This is the metric which I pulled up from some report. Uh, it could be more, it could be less, but it's in, in, it's in the thousands, uh, and that's a critical thing. And the reason for this is it's really to keep uh, consumers engaged with the brand, uh, being excited about um, the, you know, the new launches that's going to be happening. Um, now, however, having said that, not all of these thousands of innovations are successful. A very small fraction, uh, around 25% of those innovations typically have sales greater than around $7 million. Only 1% have sales exceeding over $50 million. And as you can imagine, that is where really the success comes in. But when you look at, say, 1% of 2,000, I'm going to use the US as an example, that is still 20. And when you multiply by $50 million, that's over a billion dollars in sales. So big brands get created based on this uh, success rate. And as you can imagine, a lot of these companies are looking on how to make their whole process more successful and more impactful. So today I'm going to talk a little bit in terms of the agenda, what is innovation, type of innovations. Some of it you may already know about it, but I thought from the spirit of point of transparency and so getting some consistent terminology, I wanted to share that. Um, talk a little bit about what is required for innovations to succeed. My, my personal perspective, uh, based on my 15, 20 years of experience. And with some real practical examples. A very short description in terms of how innovation is managed. And some of the culture drivers, some of the sort of um, behaviors that one needs to become more innovative. So, First, what is innovation? Um, I can start it out with a quote by Michael Eisner. There is no idea that cannot be improved upon. Every time, every sort of period, there are people who are saying everything is perfect, you don't need to make uh, improvements. I think uh, it was in the early 1900s when I think somebody said the best form of transportation, you don't need to improve upon the horse carriage. Okay. And then you had Lots of things happening after that. Um, I think uh, there was another uh, big, um, forgot his name now, um, another sort of well-known in player in the computer industry who was saying uh, no one will ever use laptops. Uh, no one would ever want computing uh, outside of mainframe computers. And once again, look at how the computer industry sort of has evolved. Uh, however, there are many definitions of um, what innovation is. Um, the general feeling of most people is it's about technology or an invention. That indeed is true. That is one of the big uh, aspects of innovation. But really, a lot of other things about something that can create new consumer values, something that addresses a need uh, that consumers have, it uses you, all of us. Something that delights consumers. After using it, you say, wow. I wish I had that. Um, for me, when Apple came out with its iPod and then its iPhone, that was my moment. Um, I had 
once it came out, I said, wow, that's what I want. It's about a creative idea when it's implemented successfully. If it sits in our head, that's not an innovation, that's an idea. But if it's implemented successfully, that is an innovation. And it's also about fresh thinking that creates value. A lot of knowledge might be there, but how do you sort of combine those different pieces of knowledge to create fresh value? Once again, innovation can be associated with various things. Generally, the perception is about products. And indeed, a lot of innovations that are visible is about products. But it can also do it with services. Uh, can do it with business models, how companies operate. Uh, can do it with the manufacturing, make things more efficient, make things more um, faster and uh, more effective. And it can also be about systems and processes. So if I were to look at a few examples, business models, um, Amazon comes to mind uh, as a business model. They come out with an online retail kind of model versus the physical bookstore. Um, in manufacturing, there's a lot of things that are constantly going on and making things more efficient, more sustainable, and companies have actually um, died and have actually emerged as a result of, of these kind of different things. And innovation also could be looked at in, uh, in a sort of these two dimensions in a sense. My x-axis is about products, about marketplaces. On the left is existing products, existing markets for certain things. On the right is new markets, new consumers, and new customers. The y-axis is really about the technology axis. On the bottom, we have known science and technology. And on the top is the new science and technology. This is a university. There's a lot of emphasis on the science and technology. Um, and it's this within this axis, you get the different kinds of innovation. The bottom left, which is the incremental innovation, is it's about known science and technology, and it's about existing markets. You're making small improvements, you're making um, you know, upgrades of things. I would say 90% of innovation happens in that space in terms of the incremental innovation. Uh, in my consumer world, it's things like you know, new fragrances, new colors, new package designs, new labels, all kinds of uh, those things. I'm, they are done, it's more design-led, you're creating known things, putting them together to create a new, more exciting uh, consumer experience. The same axis as you go up further, there is the breakthrough innovation. It is about new science, new technology that um, can create a much more dramatic uh, performance improvement. It's a high risk um, uh, because it's about new technology, some of it will succeed, some of it will not. And it's generally defensive. You're not creating new markets here. There's an incremental sales, but you're not creating dramatic incremental sales. The bottom, left, bottom right is the market innovation. It's about known uh, technology. Uh, sorry. Uh, it's about known technology that is evolving into new markets. It's about new product categories. Uh, and because it's about new product categories, consumers may or may not accept. And as a result, the risk can vary. And then on the right, top right, is the radical innovation. That is what most of us think when we're talking about innovation. And that is a high risk, high reward. It's about new science, it's about new markets. Uh, so what's happening, um, say, in the communication industry, what's happening in um, maybe some of the sort of nanotechnology fields kind of areas, that would fall, probably fall into that space. That generally is quite uh, rare. Uh, but e emphasis tends to be on that. Um, innovations could also be viewed as sustaining. So everything on the left of that previous uh, grid is effectively a sustaining innovation. It's about incremental or breakthrough in existing product category. So consumers are already aware of certain performance dimensions, and you are making improvements in that performance dimension. The disruptive innovations is when you're creating new markets, you're bringing in new consumers. Actually, if you're existing consumers of that, dislike that innovation. Uh, some examples of this sort of David versus Goliath kind of thing is when, when, the, when, it, when it was the main, main framework, most of you probably uh, won't be able to identify with that word, uh, but mainframes were very common. When I was doing my PhD thesis, it was all mainframes, and we really didn't have, you know, 
huge amount of PCs or any of those things. And when PCs came in, it was considered as a niche product which can never compete with mainframes. Now, you don't see too many mainframes. They're there, they're hidden somewhere. Similarly, if you take digital cameras, is a good, another good example. Film cameras were sort of the norm. And you had great resolution, you had great uh, you know, clarity in terms of pictures. And for the first digital camera that came up, was actually a very poor camera. Now, they've constantly improved it. Essentially, they've eliminated their film cameras. Um, so this is sort of more the sort of disruptive versus sustaining. If we take any innovation, once again, it goes to a typical S-curve. And these are true more about the disruptive kind of innovations. There's that first phase when products are out there, um, the early adopters of the sort of really passionate folks are the ones who are interested in that. It can sit there for a short period of time or it can sit there for 20, 30, 40 years. Then there is a period when it goes through an accelerated growth where it's, a lot of people get interested, a lot of people are buying these products. Then the industry matures and that is when there's a shake up in the industry. In the growth phase actually a lot of different competitors will get into that. And then there's the laggard phase um, where, you know, there are always people who are the last ones to buy uh, something. And that's when actually the market starts to decline. And in certain categories, it tends to go these, through this sort of series of S-curves um, uh, that industry sort of takes off and as it's matured, there's a new S-curve that can develop into that example. So here, for example, if you look in the tech space, um, the cell phone is a good example of something that came up probably in the late 90s, uh, also early 90s, um, and then it took off and it was sort of well, well established. But then starting in the 2000s, the smartphones came into the picture and are now starting to displace the cell phones. Well, the classical, the traditional cell phones. This was an example of bar soap or a detergent powder. Uh, detergent powders get, got introduced to the marketplace in the mid-1900s, like 1950 kind of period. And they took off, and by the 1990s, uh, 80, 70, 70 to 80 percent of the market was about detergent powders. And then in the early 90s, uh, liquid detergents started to sort of displace uh, powders. And in the U.S., uh, right now, it is uh, 70 to 80 percent of the market is uh, liquid detergents. So this occurs not only in the tech space, it occurs in, uh, across various industries. Uh, this chart is an example of how time sort of um, happens. So if we take, um, and that S-curve in that early adoption phase, sometimes it sits there for a long period of time. So if you take an automobile, uh, after it got introduced, it was sort of sitting around for 20 years before it took off. Uh, if you look at the telephone, similarly 20 years. Um, electricity as an, an enabler was also around 20 years. The aeroplane, planes basically, was all, around 40 years. But in the last 20 years, things have started to accelerate very rapidly and things are happening in 5, 10, 20 years. And maybe even faster. And part of it is because that is lower cost, we are much more connected, um, and there's a lot more emphasis on making these things sort of success, successful. Okay, now I'm going to jump into my next sort of section, which is about what are the elements for a successful innovation. I believe there are three things that are very critical. There is the element of deep science and technology, great design, and unique insights. Um, unique insights is really about understanding your target, understanding your consumers, what they want, what they need, uh, what motivates them, what inspires them, what excites them. It's a lot more emotional aspect associated with that. You actually want to live, understand what their lifestyle is. And really this is where that one plus one equals three comes in. Um, and at the end of it, when you get that unique insight, and this is the one thing which is very, very difficult for me to explain, um, it's literally like the aha moment. Okay. 
Uh, these are some quotes, for example, the first quote, which I thought sort of captures that. It, in, unique insight really is about a fresh understanding that's not obvious to the rest of the world. Um, it's about the consumer beliefs, the values, their habits, their desires, their motivations. And once you understand that, translating that into a product, into a service, that creates a new opportunity. Okay. And, so it, it, and it's not a technology push, but it's a consumer pull. Um, and these insights are rare. And quite often, innovations fail or succeed because of this. That sort of vague, unique insight aspects. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more into the science of technology, which is a little bit more uh, structured. It's about the science of scientific understanding. It's really about the new ways of measuring. Or it could be about new technologies. Um, and if I go back into the consumer product industry, and I'm going to focus on the skincare focus. Um, that industry has sort of spanned through broadly four zones. Bulk of history, it's been the traditional products. We had soap from long, long, long time back. Um, that was there. Starting around the 1950s, it was, I would sort of call it the chemistry era. So new chemistries came into the picture, new surfactants, new polymers, new emollients, and also you had new ways of measuring things. And that created this series of products that many of us currently use. Around the mid-90s, I think, based on understanding in skin biology, so it's more of the biology area, era, you started to get new ingredients based on this understanding. And I think starting around the 2000, mid-2000s, uh, it's starting to get into the area of new delivery technologies, more customized technologies, getting into an area where actually you are delivering something for, for a person, for a target. And so, so what I wanted to do was actually go through some examples for each of the phases, or once again, personal examples to give you an idea. The first one I wanted to talk about is really coming down to this designing surfactants to minimize harshness to skin. Um, surfactants are these, um, probably most of you don't know what surfactants, so let me first. So surfactants are molecules that are used in a variety of industries. Um, they effectively consist of two parts. They're organic molecules that consist of two parts. One part of it is hydrophobic, so that like, dislikes water, and the other part is hydrophilic. This dual nature creates them to modify properties of surfaces. And so effectively, they reduce surface tension, they reduce inter interfacial tension, they create foam, uh, they're used in emulsification, so bringing two incompatible materials together. And it's used in a wide variety of, and it's actually a working, um, it's a workhorse in the consumer product industry. So fundamentally what happens is you have these monomers, these surfactants that assemble into what are called micelles. And it's this behavior of the self-assembly that creates all the unique properties the surfactants exhibit. Um, so one of the brands uh, I used to work on was Dove. And for us, Dove was very important because it was all about how gentle it is to the skin. And we, so we were constantly looking at ways of improving the surfactant systems to enhance the mildness of the product. The conventional belief is, was that monomers are the only things that enter the skin. Um, and the micelles, the sort of the self-assembled things don't enter the skin. And so based on that model, there was a lot of products that are being created based on reducing the concentration of monomers. However, the reality was we were not necessarily getting milder products. And around um, sort of the mid-90s, we started to actually try to understand what is happening. Uh, why can we not sort of reduce based on that sort of conventional model? And um, so based on that monomer penetration model, if you look at the predictions, that would be sort of that line which 
uh, you can see in terms of the model predictions, it would actually show that there would be no effect. But the reality with the observed results, there was a slope. And as you increase the concentration of surfactant, we actually started to get increased uh, irritation in a sense. So this was a, and, and really this came in because we started to look at skin and um, so the surfactant knowledge was in the chemistry world, the skin knowledge was in the biology world, and the two were not interacting. And we brought into a situation where we actually got that collaboration between the biologists, the skin biologists, and the surface chemists. And that's when we got that breakthrough. And really, the model that we ended up proposing at the end of that work, it was a four-year um, research, was that actually micelles actually penetrate into the skin. Um, and the reason that occurs is when you look at micelles as the form that self-assembly, the most of the belief, most of the theories were coming from polymer science. When you looked at a size of the molecule, and invariably that was around a peak with a distribution, some sort of a Gaussian distribution around that peak. In the micellar world, the distribution is not a Gaussian peak. It actually goes something more along the sort of axis like where I showed, where you have a very large number of small micelles, but, and it decreases exponentially with some very, lar very large micelles, but with very few of them. However, the average size would be further down in terms of the axis. And what we found was the skin, typical pore size of a skin, is somewhere in the range of around 2 to 5.6 nanometers. And so you have entities that are below the 5.6 nanometers that would actually penetrate into skin. And so once this was sort of demonstrated, we started to look at how would you correct that? How would you address that? How would you tackle that? And one of the focus really was decrease the fraction of smaller micelles with polymers. So when you put polymers, they would sort of form a network, as shown here, along with the micelles. And then belief is the net result is those micelles would not be able to penetrate into skin. And indeed, when you start looking at how much of the surfactant actually penetrates into the skin, it decreases. So what's on the red axis is the surfactant alone. What's in the blue axis is when you have the surfactant combined with the polymer. And you can see dramatic drop in terms of the amount that is actually getting into skin. And this was related really is any times you have micelles that are larger than around 5 nanometers are not penetrating into skin. That was essentially what we found out. And then you take a further study in terms of looking at um, concentration of the polymer versus surfactant. You start with an initial thing where you have some very large um, entities in terms of the micelles that can penetrate skin, or it's, a, it's concentration of the surfactant in the skin. And as you increase the polymer concentration, it starts decreasing, because more and more of those micelles are actually bound with the polymer. And then as you go into the higher concentrations, you have no free um, um, sort of small micelles, and as a result, they would not penetrate. We then translated that into actual human studies where we um, started to do, do some clinicals. Uh, and when you do the clinicals, you start actually finding out that the skin is more hydrated as you increase the polymer concentration. There's less visual dryness, less vis visual irritation, and actually there's less water loss. These were all sort of critical attributes for Dove. And, and we were able to sort of go with the polymer approach to get to that. This was a model system. We never used this surfactant. You would never use this polymer because it wouldn't behave exactly. Um, but we worked with the university to create this understanding, to create this model, and then translate it into uh, actual products that were um, much more representative of that market. Um, this sort of work actually led to a very different perspective in terms of understanding of the surfactant skin interactions. And then subsequent to that, a lot of other strategies were developed. And uh, some examples are, uh, as a based on this, new surfactants came into the picture, um, specifically polymeric surfactants 
which when they assemble itself, they form these big entities that cannot penetrate skin. Um, and then new polymers came into the picture which bind better with the micelles. So once again, the fundamental understanding, the science of what is happening has translated into lots of different technologies to make the product better. So I wanted to then sort of jump onto this as my second example. Um, and this is related to anti-acne. Um, so when you take anti-acne products, uh, salicylic acid is a very, very good chemical, good chemistry to prevent acne. Uh, and it works based on simply improving cell turnover. So if you look at your skin, if there's a constant turnover of your uh, skin, you're shedding dead cells every few days, and new skin keeps coming up from the, from the from the bottom. Um, so salicylic acid, what it does, it actually promotes the healthy cell turnover so that you're not having situations where you have the dead skin sort of lying on the top. And because it prevents de dead skin from sort of remaining on the top, it prevents the growth of P. acne, which is one of the triggers for forming acne. Now when you take salicylic acid and you're creating products, it's, difficult, it's a difficult uh, material to handle. Products are difficult to thicken. They're very irritating at high concentration. You get sort of a burning kind of sensation. And you also get very poor deposition. So whatever you put into it, less than 1% actually remains in the skin. Most of it goes down the drain. So we were looking at seeing how would you sort of target this. And once again, this was a com looking at combinations of polymer and salicylic acid. And here we created a new polymer based on PVP. Um, and the PVP actually helps bind with salicylic acid. The PVP would have a slight positive charge. The salicylic acid has a negative charge. And that creates a complexation. And you would deposit that onto the skin. And the belief was that when you do a polymer salicylic acid complex, it would stay on the surface of the skin and provide a reservoir. So whenever salicylic acid is needed, it would actually get released and go down. So this left chart is a confocal microscopic uh, study. Um, and the first, the top one is a one hour after application. The bottom is a two and a half hour after application. And it's at around six, to, and I'm taking a slice at around six to eight microns below the skin surface. As you can see, and the red area indicates very high concentration of salicylic acid. The blue area shows low levels of salicylic acid. As you can see, with time, more and more salicylic acid is going in. That's good. It's actually going to where it needs to go. But when it goes into the red area, it can actually get irritating. It can create a burning kind of sensation. Second, it's not very uniform. So when we take this complex and we actually do the same delivering, we actually find it's much more uniform first. Second, it doesn't penetrate uh, into the six to eight micron uh, depth at very high levels. And the net result is it's, a, it's much more uh, less irritating and more effective in terms of uh, performance. You sort of see in an aged skin, it's much more, there's a dimension there's a, uh, that all the sort of uh, things are aligned, whereas in a young skin, it's much more random. And when you create the random kind of this one, skin tends to retract back. It's much more elastic. Whereas if you take an aged skin, it tends to be a little bit more plastic. Uh, and you can see that with the sort of various imageries. And what happens is, after this understanding of the from a skin biology perspective, we started to see what happens with dermatopontin with age. And guess what? It decreases with age. And that's the reason for what happens to, in terms of skin behavior. So we started to look at and created a, it's a bioengineered peptide that mimics the functions of dermatopontin. Uh, we developed that. And these are sort of examples, once again, of the same product in, 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 in terms of the results. So if you look at the placebo on an aged skin, once again, you have a dimensionality. There's an orientation of 
the various, uh, this one, and you can see that with the uh, red lines on the top. And moment you put in this material called actopontin, uh, you get much more randomness, and that creates that anisotropy, creates actually a much more, um, uh, how do I put it, um, um, much more elastic skin. So this product actually is there uh, currently in some of the top end uh, beauty products, skin anti-aging products like uh, some of the Estee Lauder products uh, and other uh, products of the class. And in terms of this area of the skin biology, it's going to the next phase which people are starting to create and we have actually started to create skin models uh, that utilize actual uh, skin. So these are skin models that we have created in the lab. Um, it can be the skin, it can be the oral cavity, uh, and, and when you create skin based, so you can take an individual skin and create that in the lab, and based on that, you can actually now start to create products that are very, very customized. Um, previously, we were developing products that were much more average for an average American consumer or for an average Asian consumer. Now you can create products that are targeted based on ethnicity, based on age, based on your lifestyle. Um, we are all, our constitution, there's a genetic part of it, but the, but the environment we have lived in, the, um, the foods we eat, et cetera, once again shapes our genetics, and that comes in from a perspective of what is called epigenetics. And you can study that from that perspective and you can create new products. These will be products that will probably be coming up in the next five to 10 years. Uh, but this is where the science is going on right now. The third thing I wanted to sort of touch in is related to great design. Um, you can have great science, you have great insights, but if you don't have the great design in place, most of these innovations would fail. And it's really about making the products to be intuitive, easy to use, easy to understand. And there is something called, in our world, we use the word magic moments, some, that you actually, when you're using the product or when you're purchasing the product, you actually feel the effect, feel that benefit. And why is that critical? Because when you look at great design, it's ultimately a compromise. Um, there are lots of factors that come into play. Um, you have the consumer, you have to satisfy the consumer. So you have to have the functionality with no negatives, you have to have the right sensory, you have to have the right perceived value, and the quality. You have the environment, the external and the regulatory bodies, whatever products you launch or you introduce a design, they need to meet the safety criteria, they need to be environmentally safe, you can't be violating somebody's patent or intellectual property rights, and they have to have certain standards. You also have to have a technology that delivers what you want it to deliver. Um, quite often that is a challenge, because um, you may want to do something wonderful, but if there is no technology to support it, you, you don't have that. And so there is a compromise that goes on. And then there is the whole thing about material availability um, and the ability to manufacture quality products. Sometimes you're producing um, millions of bottles, of millions of something, and you need to have consistency in the quality of the production. So if your manufacturing process is not um, robust enough, you're going to create uh, issues with that. And then there are a number of other factors that come into the picture. Um, what I want you to sort of take you through this is other example, once again, sort of very mundane example, it's liquid detergents. Okay. Uh, till around 2005, 2006, you had products like on the left, big bottles, um, and if you went into the laundry aisle, you had um, huge bottles, very um, very functional. Okay. In around 2005, based on um, various, this one, we had come up with an innovation based on concentration. 
Uh, we went with an approach where we reduced the dosage from around 100 ml per wash to around 30 to 35 ml wash. Um, and the positives was it was positive to the environment, it was positive from a consumer perspective, and retailers loved it because now instead of having you know, a big aisle that is occupied with liquid detergents, they can reduce that. And all at the same expense um, without actually increasing the cost per wash. Um, as a design, we had to sort of develop a new sort of super concentrated formulas. Um, in one respect, it's all about removing water. But when, once you remove the water, you start getting into lots of liquid crystalline phases. You get into things that are not, you can't thicken it properly. They will suddenly lump up and create problems. So all those had to be overcome. So, but, but that technology sort of came into the picture. And then we started to actually ensure that the consumer at the end of it feels good about it. So in one particular case, we took where we actually improved the whiteness when they wash with the uh, detergent, you get products that are whiter. In another case, we went with an approach of improving the fragrance delivery. Um, and so what we wanted to do was create an experience to the consumer that is more positive. And then we went with the whole new bottle. The previous bottles were very masculine, very functional. The newer bottles were more, more feminine in, in, in a sense of shape, more curves associated with that. And we went with you know, a new kind of shrink wrap to help sort of hold, the, hold and grip the bottle, um, new dosing cap, and when you do all of those things, so this is what I mean by the design. So it's just not changing the detergent alone, but it's also changing the packaging, changing the communication. And the net result was consumers loved it. This is what I meant by the magic moments. And, um, the ne and in 2006, this was launched. By 2007, the whole industry actually had to change to a, to a concentrated, uh, this one. And there was a huge impact from an environmental perspective because now we are reducing the amount of plastic that is being utilized in there, the amount of detergent that is getting transported in the road before it gets to the retailer. Uh, so it was ultimately, if you look at the, and I think we did one calculation where amount of plastic that was saved would be, if you put the bottles next to each other, it would go from here all the way to the moon. Okay, So that's the kind of impact in terms of uh, but once again, this was a simple idea, but it is how the great design ultimately helps in translating that. And coming to sort of the end, um, this is typically an innovation process. The first phase is really defining the opportunity areas. Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned, it comes down to the unique insights. It's defining the customer. Who are you targeting? who is going to be the user of your product. What is the job that they are looking to get done by using this product? Uh, and it's a very different perspective. When you think about uh, detergent, as, as I'll use that example, we think about detergent as something that cleans clothes. But for the consumer perspective, what is the job they're trying to do is about making their clothes refreshed once again so that they can wear it once again. And when you come from that perspective, you think about it differently. Uh, then it comes to sort of uncovering customer needs, discovering the unmet needs, and then looking at the segments of opportunity. Then you come, that effectively shapes the innovation strategy for large companies. And then the bottom part of it is starting to work in terms of providing the customized solutions, creating the projects, um, defining the solution, first developing the solution, then evaluating the solution, and then manufacturing that. So it goes through a very, very structured process, uh, and you end up at the end with uh, the products. So this is another way of sort of looking at it. Um, very structured, you go through various gates. In the beginning is what is called the idea phase. You're brainstorming, you're looking at lots of different ideas whether the ideas can from, come from internal, can come from external. Then you go into the phase of developing solutions to meet those ideas. Uh, it's a lot of prototyping goes in. You create 
the mock-up examples. Uh, during that period of time, you probably are sourcing in technologies. You're looking at what's happening, uh, what's there in the outside world. Then you're going to the testing and optimization phase. A lot of ideas start, as you see, the number of ideas are reducing because a lot of them die as you go through that gates. Um, then you go into the commercialization phase. Sometimes if companies are not successful on their own, if it doesn't fit their business strategy, they might license it. It might go into new, uh, it might be about new companies. And then finally, a small fraction of the projects actually get launched. Um, the key metrics you're looking at it in terms of the managing this innovation process is alignment of the business, the number of projects, because if you have too many projects, you have not enough people to work on the projects. And if you don't have the brains, you don't have good solutions. The type of projects, uh, the balancing the risk reward, um, resources, and success. So these are all the sort of key metrics one looks at. And thinking about from a perspective of how, one, how companies are looking to make, make it more innovative. I think a critical bit is the curiosity. Um, why? Um, the, that, quest, that simple question, why, um, has huge um, sort of merits. The why, what if, why not, how does it work? Sort of the constant questioning, the constant trying to understand what's happening. Uh, helps both from a consumer perspective and also from a technology perspective. Second, I think, is about keeping an open mind. It's networking because ideas come in from various. This one, I gave you an example where when you brought in a biologist and a chemist, you got uh, creative solutions. So it's about you know that getting out of that comfort zone, going into new areas and things like that. Third bit is failure is okay. Okay, um, we are often used to this culture where failure is actually a negative uh, word. Um, in the innovation world, fail early, fail often is, I think, a very, very important um, sort of motto. Now, fail, don't look at it in that negative verse. When you fail, learn from it. It's not just sort of stop at that failure. And it's also not giving up at the first obstacle, constantly looking at the solutions, finding positive solutions. Another one is, what are your frustrations? Um, most innovations occur when there is a frustration. A consumer is having a pain somewhere. Um, when you are doing something, um, and I'm sure all of you can think of various examples in your sort of personal life, as you're handling a device or as handling something, there's a frustration, there is a pain. Those are all brilliant opportunity areas for innovation. Um, for example, I hate my TV. In terms of navigating through, if I want to find a certain channel, it's very, very difficult finding a certain channel or finding a certain program. And you can see opportunities happening in that area in terms of you know, the searchability, in terms of navigating, in terms of all of those things. And then the last bit is it's OK to borrow. It's quite often when people are thinking about technology, they want to develop everything from scratch. It's OK to borrow. There are ideas that other industries have actually tackled. Um, in my last job, uh, I was responsible for industries ranging from construction, paints and coatings, um, all the way to skin care, anti-aging, wound healing. So you would think there is no connection between these different industries. But in reality, there was a lot of connections. And sometimes we used to take an idea from paints and coatings, obviously not exactly the same technology, but modifications of that that would end up in wound healing or vice versa. And so in summary, I would sort of say, it, I think innovation is very, very critical to many industries. I tried to give you some examples from my world because I wanted to bring it to life. Um, it is a blend of art and science. There is absolutely the science from the science and technology perspective. There is the science in terms of how you manage the innovation process. But there's a lot about the art, the feeling, how consumers feel, where are their pain points, sort of understanding all of that, that's very, very critical. Um, 
innovation can be learned and is, and, is, and is fun. I have actually absolutely enjoyed it. And I wanted to sort of end with this quote. Um, we are given this niche, niches, small worlds of our own, populated by only a handful, where we feel understood. Our bubble worlds bump into innumerable others daily, but there is little cause to allow their integrity to be breached. Um, it's by someone named Tom Quackenbush. Um, and my plea is burst the bubbles, because if we live in our own sort of domain, not interacting with the others, um, that's where you are. And innovation comes in by bursting the bubbles, by sort of going across. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the floor to questions. I'm sorry. One of the challenges is creating an environment in which you can fail quickly, fail early, and recover and learn from that. Uh, so whether you're talking about an academic setting or in your own unwilling to take risks, getting out of their comfort zone, getting ahead. So I think it's very critical from an organization perspective to build that culture, to tolerate um, and actually encourage uh, failure. Uh, so some of the things you would want to do is sometimes actually when there are ideas, you would let uh, individuals be able to explore it, take it to a certain point before they have to make big presentations, okay? uh, before they have to seek uh, certain um, and unfortunately, not all companies have that sort of tolerance for failure. Um, so the skunk works kind of approach is very critical, but you don't want to do it in a wasteful manner. You want to do it, um, that's why the fail early, fail, because by failing early, you're not um, giving up any time. The other very simple thing is that, you know, the standard, uh, like a Friday afternoon, kind of model where people can experiment with their own ideas um, without it being in a very formal structure. Questions? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I had an interesting conversation about a year ago with two washing machine service professionals uh, who said that the uh, they were complaining that the, the new con highly concentrated laundry detergents um, are leading to consumers, uh, consumers will try to use the same amount as the old detergent, and it ends up clogging up uh, the machines and causing all kinds of problems. So my question is, now you, if you're faced with, uh, with this particular product, an unintended consequence, right? how is it in the early in the design cycle that you can do some kind of analyses to, to pretty much predict and then avoid these unintended consequences? Uh. Yeah, and, and in fact, as you go concentrated, you get into uh, these liquid crystalline phases. And once you get into the liquid crystalline phases, some of them like the hexagonal phases, it's very, very difficult for it to sort of disperse. Um, and that's part of the reason that area people have not explored in the past. And when you go into a manufacturing environment, there's always variability. People overdose something an underdosing or whatever happens. So you have to design your, your formulation in, an, in a space that is, to some extent, I would say, free of these phases, liquid phases, and even considering the fact that there could be errors. That's one. So the, it, it's not the amount of detergent that is dosed that's the issue. The issue is just the phase behavior of that detergent. Um, now, having said that, there is, a, there is an un unintended consequence. The manufacturers are happy about it. Probably the consumers are unhappy. These yeah. people are overdosing. Okay. And, and, and I think it's a job of the manufacturers to constantly educate. And some manufacturers have actually changed the caps to be smaller. Some have not. Okay. So, 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I just wish there were ways that the designers specifically would, would think ahead about these things. And then we wouldn't have all that you know, I agree. economic manipulation, so to speak, by the manufacturers as well. It just, it, the unintended consequences wipe up the very thing. Yeah. You said, do you, you know of work on uh, muscle tendon? You mentioned skin artificial skin. Uh, no, I do, I'm not. Are you aware of work? I'm, I'm not aware of that work. <coughs> it's about repairing, I believe, as well. Uh, okay. So, okay. so can you repeat the question? Are you aware of muscle tendon? Muscle tendon repairs? No, I'm not. I, I wonder for our students, um, how are you assessing in the job market? when you're recruiting, how are you assessing the, the potential candidates in a vein of quotient, per se? <laughs> okay, I think it comes down to, um, the, for me, when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the curiosity. I'm looking at the ability for individuals to learn, um, ability to adapt to sort of circumstances. Quite often, I think what happens is when, especially, uh, fresh um, out of school, certain students come in, and there is this perception as I know it all. Okay. And, and some of it is a more bookish knowledge, and it's that practical knowledge that we're sort of looking for. So it's, it's, it's all these factors one is looking at. Um, we're also looking at the ability for people to listen. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes when people come in for an interview, they're not listening. They're just, you know, uh, answering certain questions the way they're thinking. Um, so there's a little bit of art in that. Of course, of course. Okay, so. My question is uh, regarding your design concept. So it, it's kind of a uh, known fact that if you have the product already established and you are trying to improve, then it's much easier to develop the design concept in terms of. So, I am sort of in the mode of critic, so don't you call this as an incremental innovation with that, respect that. to where you are really, especially when you are talking about innovation, it means the new science. Not uh, necessarily, that's why I'm, I started out with the four uh, right. matrix. So this would, I would call the concentration probably somewhere in between incremental to a um, um, little bit more the breakthrough, okay, because of the uh, some of the technical complexity associated with the so, but, uh, my, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My question is like, for example, we in the academia, university people have been criticized in terms of what you call that slide type in science and technology. When you work in that zone, since we are not really targeting the consumer market, we are slow in terms of delivering the actual product. So, industry cannot cooperate, even they want, even they appreciate the new science and technology because of the money involved and the time associated with the new innovation, it becomes hard for them to cooperate that new science and technology. So how do you think that we so, can manage okay. the challenge? I think, we, so because it really comes back down to the slowness and the sort of speed associated with that. So first I think there is both sides, there's two sides to it. Industry sometimes is impatient. And industry sometimes does not necessarily look at from a technical feasibility perspective. Um, I've had many discussions, and I've sort of bridged in a sense between the two areas. So I've had discussions, um, and I, I'll give you this example. So when we were working on soaps, okay, we were looking at one idea, and somebody started to talk about soaps that can prevent skin cancer. So actually it went in and saying, let's create a soap that can cure skin cancer. Okay. Now we are getting into the domain of technical impossibility. Okay. At least you are violating, maybe not any laws of physics or science, but at least based on known physics, known science. Okay. And that person who was asking had no idea of the technical difficulty. And that does happen, unfortunately. And I think part of the job of academia is to define that boundaries of what is known in terms of science and technology. 
and being able to explain to that individual saying this is impossible. But we could do this and so sort of come back to So it's about listening to what that uh, industry partner wants. They may not, they, the words they may use, the questions they may ask may not be the right things. So job of academia sometimes to ask, make them ask the right questions. The second thing that comes down to the slowness. Um, and I think sometimes the slowness is real. It takes, because science is all about the unknown. So you're going from, you're creating that understanding. So it will take its own time. Um, it's, and I think, however, once you get to a certain point, I think it's sometimes the scientific world is in this domain of, um, is putting together data that the industry does not understand. Okay. So creating prototypes, creating things that will, um, that the industry partner can understand, I think is very important. Okay. Um, so if you are generating some data, maybe data that is more meaningful to the industry partner rather than a very, you know, you might use very high-end um, scientific methods, but if that industry partner does not understand that or does not meaningful, uh, it's, it does not make sense. Prototypes are so amazingly powerful because it brings it to life. You can hold a different touch it. a simple uh, observation. Uh, in, in your presentation, you, you did mention that the young skin is more random, um, whereas the dead skin is uh, more aligned in, in a particular form, or structure, in other words. Uh, it's actually defying the logic, because uh, what we are trying to do in nanoscience and nanomaterials, we are producing Structures, structured uh, nanomaterials, and, uh, and we are trying to replicate the so that nature is reproduced, you know, in a way. Um, whereas the nature is telling us that randomness is better. So, uh, why is this uh, discontinuity? So it, it's, it's randomness in this particular case. Okay. Um, so it comes back down to it, it depends on the properties you're looking for. Um, so when you have, uh, um, so if you take, and I'm going to use an analogy. So if you take logs, okay, if the logs are sort of scattered around randomly, the random orientation, it will not move very easily. It will have certain rigidity associated with that. Whereas when you align them all in the same direction, it will flow in that direction. So that's a kind of model that is coming in. So I think it all depends on the context. In certain cases, having a structure, having a certain isotropic can actually help. Okay. In this particular case, it was not, um, it, it was working the other way around. Any other questions? Well, please join me in thanking our guest speaker today.